Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 30th. Today we celebrate the author and poet who wrote some beautiful garden verses. We'll also learn about a magnificent Australian artist and botanical illustrator, and her art is now part of Australia's National Library. We celebrate the selection of the state flower of Arkansas and the very cute story of how it came to be picked. Did you catch that pun? We honor the life of the poet and World War I soldier who wrote what is probably the most popular poem ever about trees. And we grow that garden library with a book about living naturally with eco-friendly ideas that don't sacrifice style, function, or sustainability. And then we'll wrap things up with the very first Academy Award winning animated cartoon that gardeners love. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners from around the world and today's curated news. Well, first up is a picture I was sent from Betty M. that shows her standing by an oak tree over 60 years ago. And the oak tree commemorated the birth of her baby brother. So there she is standing by the tree in her cute little dress. She looks to be about three or four years old there. And then she included another picture of her standing by the tree In 2018, there's a 60-year difference between the two pictures. Betty said the oak tree was planted on August 1st, so we're coming up on its 62nd birthday. So we're going to say happy birthday to the Betty Oak from all the Daily Gardeners. Happy 62nd birthday and many more. And then also in the mail today, I received a very sweet video from Linda Beardsley. Linda maintains five hummingbird feeders on her property. And as a result, her garden is just teeming with hummingbirds. And of course, Linda knows the secret to attracting hummingbirds. It's to make your own simple syrup. No need to go out and buy the dyed water that looks red. All you need to do is mix equal parts water with equal parts sugar. You'll have a clear liquid that you can put in your red accented feeder and you'll have hummingbirds like crazy. Hummingbirds really are one of the highlights of summer. I love them. My neighbor's got a feeder next door so he sees them all the time. And I have a feeder here. I just haven't gotten around to putting it outside with all the renovation going on. But I'm going to do it. This is my reminder. And it's not too late. So if you've been thinking about doing it, go ahead and prepare to be enchanted. All right, that's it for today's Gardener Greetings. Now, if you'd like to participate in the Gardener Greetings segment, just send your garden pics, your videos, stories, and birthday wishes to me. Just email me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. That's jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can make that very easy for yourself just by adding me as a contact in your phone. Just create a contact that says The Daily Gardener Podcast, and then under the email, put jennifer at thedailygardener.org. Then when you're out and about taking pictures of your garden or of some beautiful scenery, you can go ahead and easily email me. And I love that. I love getting mail from you guys. All right, here's today's curated news. Today's post is from the Director of Science at Kew, and the headline of this article caught my attention because it said, It's time to decolonize botanical collections. This passionate editorial was written by Professor Alexander Antonelli, and he is the Kew Gardens Director, responsible for the world's largest collection of plants and fungi. He was born and raised in Brazil, and he wrote and shared this landmark piece on the Conversation Research website. 
Alexander believes that the time has come to decolonize botanical collections by ridding the field of structural racism. Here's an excerpt. I've often struggled to answer the simple question, where are you from? As I was born and raised in Brazil, and like many people, my origin is mixed. I dislike predefined labels. At school, I was taught that Brazil was, quote, discovered in 1500 by the Portuguese. The fact that several million people lived there prior to that was barely mentioned in our books. We were told of a long history of brutal exploitation of our natural resources, including vast amounts of gold, rubber, and timber. All this was achieved through the exploitation of our native people and African slaves, including my own ancestors. That Brazil is the world's most biodiverse country astounded colonial botanists. Charles Darwin was astonished that our lands, quote, teemed with life, as was Alfred Russell Wallace, who spent years in the Amazon. It is not lost on me that these were both white British men. I am now head of science at Kew, responsible for the world's largest collections of plants and fungi. For hundreds of years, colonial botanists would embark on dangerous expeditions in the name of science, but they were ultimately tasked with finding economically profitable plants. Scientists continue to report how new species are discovered every year, species that are often already known and used by people in the region and have been for thousands of years. The first inhabitants of Brazil and the first users of plants in Australia often remain unnamed, unrecognized, and uncompensated. They are quite literally invisible in history. This needs to change. Well, I have to say that when I read this commentary by Alexander, it struck a chord with me because, of course, I do this podcast, and a huge part of the podcast is botanical history. And I spend a good deal of every day mining through botanical archives all over the Internet. And this is an issue I constantly bump up against. One of my original goals with the show was to help all of us have a deeper appreciation of where our plants come from, especially since many of the plants that we know and love are non-native. And that includes everything from our plants in the office to our plants in our homes, as well as the plants that are in our own backyards, in our parks and public spaces. Botanical history, as you're probably aware, is not something that's taught in schools. And information about plants was often reserved for the elite, for the wealthy, for the educated, and yes, mostly white men. Now, there are many days when I'm doing research where I can completely geek out on the person or topic that I'm researching. And I love that feeling of discovering something new or something little known about a botanist or a plant. But every now and then, I run across something disturbing. And it's very difficult for me because in that moment, I have to confront the dark side of botanical history. And in many cases, these stories have just been left hanging out there. It's not that there's a cover-up. It's just that they're not talked about. And they're certainly not told. And this is why what Alexander wrote is really quite stunning especially coming from someone in leadership at Q. And so I think this is great, and I hope it's the beginning of a change. And I hope it opens the door, not only to all of the collections and practices at Q and other organizations, but also to how the stories pertaining to botanical history get told. Now, Alexander's editorial is much longer than the little paragraph that I shared with you, and I encourage you to take a moment and read it, because it really is groundbreaking. And of course, I've shared it in the Facebook group for the show, 
So the next time you're there, all you need to do is search for the word Q, K-E-W, and Alexander's article from the Conversation Research website will be right there at your fingertips so you can read it and then hopefully share it with your garden friends. All right, so today I wrote a post for the blog called Summon Your Courage and Grow Castor Bean. And by the way, castor bean is one of Michael Pollan's favorite plants. Check out the way he starts his article on the plant called Consider the Castor Bean. Pretty they are not, but a garden can labor under a surfoot of prettiness, be too sweet or cheerful for its own good. Sometimes what's needed in the garden is a hint of vegetal menace, of nature run tropically, luxuriantly amok. And for this, I recommend the castor bean. Well, while most of us have heard of castor oil, which you get by crushing and processing the seeds, growing the castor bean plant can be a new adventure for most gardeners. And the castor bean plant is the only member of the genus Ricinus communis, and it belongs to the Spurge family. And I know what you're thinking, but hold that thought. Because unlike other members of the Euphorbia family, the castor bean does not have that milky latex sap. The sap of the castor bean is watery. The giant tropical leaves and peculiar seed pods make the plant an exotic addition to your garden. It's a native plant from Ethiopia, and the castor bean there can grow up to 40 feet tall because there it can grow year-round, whereas here we often just grow it for the summer. For most gardeners who grow castor bean as an annual in a single season, we'll see it grow very, very quickly and vigorously, but it will only get to be about 8 to 10 feet tall. And around here, that's pretty tall for a summer garden plant. Now, if you grow castor bean, red flashing light, red flashing light, you need to be aware that the seeds are extremely poisonous. And if you have kids around, you're going to want to keep those plants out of reach. And you can even eliminate the seeds altogether by cutting off the flowering spike. And as you probably suspected from the Latin name that I mentioned earlier, the toxin in castor seeds is ricin, one of the world's deadliest natural poisons. In fact, here's a story for you. During the Cold War, the Bulgarian journalist Gorgi Markov was killed when an umbrella, rigged as a pellet rifle, shot a small BB into his leg as he stood in line at a bus stop. Well, after Markov died in 1978, Scotland Yard investigated, and they found that very small BB. It was the size of a pinhead, and it had been drilled with two holes to make an X-shaped cavity. And those holes had been packed with ricin. The holes had been coated with a sugary substance that trapped the ricin inside the BB, and the coating on that little BB was designed to melt at body temperature, at which time the ricin was free to be absorbed into the bloodstream and ultimately killed him. It's quite a story, and it speaks to ricin's potency. Now, despite their unnerving history, castor beans are still good garden plants. They are beautiful with cannas and bananas and elephant ears, especially if you have a tropical garden, and they make a beautiful backdrop for grasses. They're stunning in the back of a flower border, and they can also create a magnificent screen for you in no time. Now, if you decide to grow castor beans, just remember that they're tropical, they do best in full sun, and they don't like wet feet, so plant them high and dry or in well-drained locations. Now, if you'd like to read my original blog post for yourself, 
Just search for the word caster in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will pop up. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out any of my curated articles or original blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show, the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for the Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the author and poet Emily Bronte. She was born on this day in 1818. Emily's older sister by two years was Charlotte, and her younger sister and closest friend was Anne. And as the saying goes, they were two peas in a pod. Emily's mom died when she was three. She also lost two older sisters, Maria and Elizabeth, when she was six. And the result of this loss was an exceptional closeness between the four surviving Bronte children. So you had Charlotte, Emily, Anne, and their brother Branwell. Now, a while back, Emma Emerson wrote a piece called The Bronte Garden, and in it she revealed that the Brontes were not ardent gardeners, although Emily and Anne treasured their currant bushes as their own bit of a fruit garden. And Charlotte once wrote, Emily wishes to know if the Sicilian pea, Pisum sativum, and the crimson cornflower are hardy flowers, or if they're delicate and should be sown in warm and sheltered situations. And Emily's father, Patrick, once wrote this charming little poem. Oh, why, in the snow and storms of December, when the branches lie scattered and strewn, do we oftest and clearest and dearest remember the sunshine, and summer of June. As for Emily, gardeners enjoy her poem about friendship. Love is like the wild rosebriar, friendship like the holly tree. But the holly is dark when the rosebriar blooms, but which will bloom most constantly? The wild rosebriar is sweet in the spring, its summer blossoms scent the air. Yet wait till winter comes again, and who will call the wild briar fair? Then scorn the silly rose wreath now, and deck thee with the holly's sheen, that when December blights thy brow, he still may leave thy garland green. And then finally, Emily wrote this wonderful poem about this time of year. Fall leaves, fall die, flowers away. Lengthen night and shorten day. Every leaf speaks bliss to me, fluttering from the autumn tree. I shall smile when wreaths of snow blossom where the rose should grow. I shall sing when night's decay ushers in a drearier day. And today is the birthday of the Australian artist and botanical illustrator Ellis Rowan. She was born on this day in 1848. In a 1994 newspaper article, Sarah Guest described Ellis this way. She was an explorer. She set off alone at 68 for Papua New Guinea and died in 1922. She dyed her hair red, had a facelift, left her husband. The suggestion is that she was bored. She was a member of one of Victoria's greatest pastoralist families. She was a much-admired, prolific, 
technically proficient and joyous painter of plants and birds, and a conservationist. She campaigned to stop the slaughter of birds for the decoration of ladies' hats. And in her day, she was known as Australia's brilliant daughter, which indeed she was. Ellis discovered painting after her botanist husband, Frederick, encouraged her to develop a talent. Ellis developed her passion into her profession, and it led her to unknown parts of Australia. During the First World War, Ellis was living in New Guinea, and at one point she painted 45 of the 62 known species of birds of paradise. As a woman living during the mid-1800s, Ellis followed the dress code of her era. Wherever she went, whether on an expedition or at home, she was always impeccably dressed, wearing heavy ankle-length dresses, high collars with full sleeves, complete with crinolines, corsets, whalebone stays, and a hat. Just before Ellis died, the federal parliament in Australia debated whether or not to buy a thousand of her paintings. The Australian artist and novelist Norman Lindsay had called her work vulgar. Lindsay didn't think wildflowers were worthy subjects for real art. But ultimately, Ellis's paintings were purchased for $5,000 and they're now a treasured part of Australia's National Library. And it was on this day in 1901 that the General Assembly of Arkansas selected the apple blossom as the floral emblem. And it was on this day in 1901 that the General Assembly of Arkansas selected the apple blossom as the floral emblem. Now, this selection was not without controversy. The Floral Emblem Society, led by Love Herrett Wilkins Barton, had supported the apple blossom. But the Arkansas Federation of Women's Clubs wanted the passion flower, and the disagreement between the two groups became known as the Battle of the Blooms. Now, Love Harriet Wilkins Barton became a one-woman crusader for the apple blossom. She wrote articles and memos to newspapers, even personally mailed letters to affluent citizens. And whenever she sent anything, she included a promotional pamphlet that she had created praising the apple blossom. In an ingenious move, she not only promoted the apple blossom, but she also dissed the passion flower, saying it was as pretty as a non-native of Arkansas, and also that it would grow anywhere the farmer's hoe let it. Ouch. When the legislature was set to vote, Love appeared at the Capitol wearing, wait for it, a bright apple red dress. And she totally pulled a Martha Stewart and personally gifted every lawmaker with an apple and a note. And the note said, these are the results of our beautiful apple blossoms. But what is the result of a passion flower? A dried shriveled pod. Well played, love. In unearthed words, today is the anniversary of the death of the journalist, poet, and World War I soldier, Alfred Joyce Kilmer. He was born in Brunswick, New Jersey, and he was killed in action while serving as a sergeant in the 165th Infantry Regiment on July 30th, 1918. And every year on his birthday in April, when there's not a pandemic, Kilmer's childhood home at 17 Joyce Kilmer Avenue in New Brunswick holds an open house from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Alfred is best remembered for his poem, Trees. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed 
against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And Alfred also wrote these two little poems. The first one's called Spring. The air is like a butterfly with frail blue wings. The happy earth looks at the sky and sings. And then finally, here's this one he wrote called Old Poets. If I should live in a forest and sleep underneath a tree, no grove of impudent saplings would make a home for me. I'd go where the old oaks gather, serene and good and strong, and they would not sigh and tremble and vex me with a song. It's cute. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Natural Living Style by Selena Lake. This book came out in March of 2019, and the subtitle is Inspirational Ideas for a Beautiful and Sustainable Home. In her review of this book, Julie from Try Small Things said, They say change starts at home. What I've come away with from natural living style are all kinds of ideas for reducing plastics and waste around the home in favor of natural or greener alternatives. As it turns out, they can be functional, sustainable, and that's inspired living. Selena's book is divided into sections, inspirations, textures, natural living spaces, and the natural garden, where Selena writes about green gardening, growing your own food, and exploring, enjoying, and living in the natural world. Now you can get a copy of Natural Living Style by Selena Lake and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $16. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. On this day in 1932, Walt Disney premiered his first award-winning animated cartoon. The short film was called Flowers and Trees, and it was the very first cartoon to use Technicolor. Flowers and Trees was supposed to be a black-and-white cartoon, but Walt Disney decided it would make the perfect test film for the new Technicolor process. It turns out the vivid colors of the natural world were the ideal subject for a Technicolor production. Meanwhile, the Mickey Mouse short films were judged to be successful enough, and they remained in black and white until 1935. But back on this day, in 1932, Flowers and Trees premiered at the Chinese Theater in Los Angeles and it won the Academy Award for Animated Short Subject. In this adorable film, a beautiful girl tree is wooed by a handsome boy tree, while an evil old leafless tree attempts to steal her away. The two trees end up dueling for her affection, and when the old tree loses the battle, he sets the forest on fire. But it's all for naught because the plants in the forest end up working together and they put the fire out. And in the end, the two trees are together and happy. They get engaged in the final seconds of the movie. The boy tree gives the girl tree a ring made from a curled up caterpillar. And as the trees embrace, bellflowers begin to play the wedding march, while the other flowers end up dancing around the hugging trees. 
Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Rayleigh, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.